Today I'm going to talk about how we can efficiently get robots to do what we want using human feedback. There are lots of things we might want robots to do, like cooking, cleaning, or doing our laundry, but humans need some way of communicating these goals to agents. Let's say we want to teach a robot how to do laundry. Well, there are many ways of trying to do this. One way is with reinforcement learning or RL. In order to train a robot with RL, we need to give it a suitable reward function to optimize. Unfortunately, providing a good reward function is challenging in practice. How might we design a reward function for the laundry task? Initially, we might try a sparse reward function that just returns a value of 1 when the robot has successfully completed the task. However, this won't work as the agent won't discover the positive reward until it randomly does laundry, which is unlikely to happen. Alternatively, we could hand engineer a bunch of different dense reward signals. While this may lead to some task progress, it's hard to write distances for every aspect of the task, and we might still end up failing after hours of engineering effort. Moreover, hand design reward functions might not capture what we actually want. For example, let's say that we want a robot to learn how to close a door like this. Notice how it uses the handle like a human would. If we define a reward function as just the angle of the door, the robot learns to slam the corner of the door instead of using the handle. Rather than doing a bunch of design work, it would be much easier to just ask a human which of these two behaviors that they prefer. We can then use this information to learn a reward model that could be used to train the robot. This is the basis of preference-based RL. Today I'm going to talk about how we can make preference-based RL much more efficient. First, I'll overview preference-based learning and how it can be used to teach robots. Then I'll introduce our method, few-shot preference-based reinforcement learning. And finally, I'll empirically demonstrate that our method drastically reduces the number of human preferences needed to train policies. Let's start with preference-based learning. Let's say we want to teach a robot to open a drawer like so. Preference-based learning repeatedly shows users different options and asks them which they prefer. In practice, these options are often snippets of behavior. In this first frame, we see a robot in front of the drawer, and then it gets closer, and then it ultimately slams into the handle. This might be one option that we show user. Then we'll have another option. The robot starts in roughly the same position. By time set 10, it's grabbed the handle, and by time set 25, it's opened the drawer. This could be a second option. The user would indicate that they prefer the segment at the top as it's actually opening the drawer, and we would use this data in order to train a reward model. To summarize, in preference-based reinforcement learning, human preferences are used to train a reward model, and that reward model can later be used to train a reinforcement learning agent. This has numerous advantages. Human preferences are aligned with user intent and easy to collect, and learned reward models provide dense signals for optimization. Unfortunately, these reward models are hard to learn. Let's talk about why this is. There are tons of potential behaviors we might want to see, and consequently tons of potential queries to ask. To address this problem, we might try and ask the most informative questions. Prior works in active learning have done this using information theoretic objectives and simple models. To do this, they first designed some features on top of the state space, like gripper distance, the drawer's distance, and the general smoothness of the behavior. Then they designed simple, often linear reward models on top of these features. So we could take the features that we've selected use them to ask questions that optimize some type of information theoretic objective, learn a linear reward model, and then finally use this reward model to train a policy. Unfortunately, the policy doesn't work. This is because the simple features used to learn the reward function were too simple to capture the complexity of the task. Specifically, we can't model the nonlinear paths to grab the door handle with the features chosen in our linear models. With these approaches, we've just traded our reward design problem with an equally hard feature design problem. Instead, we need to model nonlinear complex reward functions. To do so, we can use neural networks. Expressive neural networks don't require feature design, so we can just directly co collect preferences from humans. Comparisons are often chosen by maximizing the disagreement of an ensemble of reward models. We can take these preferences and learn a neural model by backpropagation. However, deep networks have millions of parameters instead of the three used in our linear model. And so in order to train a good reward model, we'll likely need many more queries. With tens of thousands of queries, we can learn a smooth reward model and ultimately train a successful policy. However, the problem with this approach is that it requires way too much data to be practical, especially when the data has to come from humans. On one end of the spectrum, we have simple models which are feedback efficient, but are too inexpressive for complex, complex tasks. On the other side, we have deep models which are highly expressive, but take way too much data. 
This led us to think about how we could learn expressive reward functions using as few queries as possible. In the standard paradigm for human in the loop reinforcement learning, we iteratively ask a human for preferences, use those preferences to update a reward function, and then collect more data as we train the policy. Our key insight is that tasks are usually not learned in isolation. We can use multitask data to pre-train a neural reward model and then adapt it to new tasks using only a handful of preferences. Let's talk about how we do this. The first step is to generate a multitask preference data set. We can take an existing task like closing a door and extract behavior segments. In this first step, we see a robot reaching towards the door, leaving that door at this half closed position. The door remains in largely the same position, but it's sort of at this half closed angle. This might be one segment. In the second segment, we see that the door is much more open. And as the segment proceeds, we see that the position of the door hasn't changed and it remains at this more open position. For this task, we might conclude that the first segment is better as we're trying to get the robot to close the, close the door. These labels, or the preference labels, can come from different sources. They can come from previously known reward functions, by injecting noise into known policies, or by comparing policies across different tasks. We can repeat this behavior segment extraction and labeling process for a bunch of different tasks. And we finally assemble all of these data, set, data points into a multi-task preference data set. Next, we need to train the reward function. We do this by taking the preference segments, here are the same ones from the last slide, and train a classifier to predict which segment was preferred. Specifically, this is done using a bradley terrence preference model, where the logits are given by the sum of predicted rewards over each segment. Then, the neural network is trained using standard binary cross-entropy loss. While this trains the reward model, it doesn't train it to be adaptive with only a few preferences. Let's take one task from our dataset. Starting from some initial weights, we want our network to learn the optimal weights for this task with only a few preferences. Concretely, we want to perform well on the new task with only a few gradient steps. However, we don't want this to be true for only one task. We want it to be true for all of the tasks in our dataset. We thus explicitly optimize our network to have low preference loss after a few gradient steps on a new task. This directly forms the objective for model agnostic meta-learning. Finally, we need to actually learn policies. Starting with the new task, we can collect some data, extract behavior segments via disagreement, show them to users, and use their feedback to train an ensemble of reward models. We iteratively repeat this process to learn a better reward function and train the policy. This forms the basis of the previously state-of-the-art Pebble algorithm. However, without using our pre-trained model, we run into the aforementioned problem. We need tons and tons of queries. Here's an example. If we only use 1,000 queries, Pebble is unable to teach the robot how to open the drawer. Once we use 20,000 queries, Pebble makes progress on the task, but it doesn't perfectly converge and is subject to huge variations in runs due to the additional randomness of active learning. Let's take Pebble and add pre-training. We start by taking our prior tasks, pre-training the reward model, as described before, and then using the human queries to adapt the reward model to the new task. Crucially, we reset the model every time we collect new feedback. We call this few-shot preference learning. Using this technique, we hope to drastically reduce the number of queries needed to learn the new task. Finally, let's see how this approach works in practice. We evaluate our approach on the MetaWorld benchmark by assembling a preference data set using 10 prior tasks and noisy policies to collect a multi-task preference data set. We then pre-train a reward model, which we will use to adapt to new tasks downstream. Let's look at a simple block manipulation task. Pebble fails to learn any meaningful behavior with only around 1,000 queries. However, our approach, which leverages the pre-trained data, learns a perfect policy, picking up the block and placing it into the target position with a near 100% success rate. The overall result of our method is that we require 20 times or fewer preferences required than Pebble. This trend holds across a large set of tasks, where our approach shown in orange drastically outperforms Pebble with a limited query budget. Our method also works in the real world. Here's a Frankenpanda arm trying to push a block to a goal location. Again, Pebble fails to make any progress, but when we look at our approach, it's able to push the block into the target goal location because it has been pre-trained on a lot of data and doesn't need that many preferences.
Because of the increase in query efficiency, we can also ask real human users to train manipulation policies. Here's a window closed task with only 64 human queries. Pebble fails to make any progress, but our fuchsia method converges to the near optimal policy using only a few noisy human queries. Moreover, the fuchsia method seems to ask questions that are easier to answer. Human users tend to be more accurate answering the queries from our model instead of the unpretrained model used in Pebble. Let's further investigate this effect. Suppose we want to train the robot to close the door. Pebble, in its first comparison, shows the door wide open and the robot arm. By the 25th time step of the behavior, the robot arm has maybe moved a little bit closer to the door, but it looks like it's largely in the same position. In the second segment shown to the user in Pebble, the robot starts in a similar looking position and ends in also a different position. If we isolate just the arm, we see that Pebble chose to show the user a query that asked the user to reason about the different joint angles of the robot. This is a difficult query for a human to actually answer. If we look at what our method does, in the first shot, we see that the robot is near the door handle and it hasn't moved, but the door is largely in the same position. That might be the first segment. In the second segment, we see that the door is much more closed just like we might want. If we isolate just the door position, we can see that the second segment shows behavior that we are much more likely to prefer as it's closer to completing the task of closing the door. This is much more easy for a human to answer. And so it's obvious that we would prefer the bottom segment. Now that we've seen how Fuchsia preference-based RL improved upon previous state-of-the-art results, we can look at what's next. One thing that hasn't had enough focus is generating easy to answer queries. Here's the previous example that Pebble showed the user from before, where the robot arm was in largely similar positions. Asking queries that maximize disagreement often results in queries that only differ slightly in joint positions, and humans have a hard time reasoning about this. It would be interesting to develop methods that focus on answering, asking questions that are easier for humans to answer. Furthermore, one limitation of our method is the breadth of data that can be used for pre-training. If the target domain looks different than the pre-training domain, we wouldn't expect our few shot method to perform much better than training from scratch. Later, we might want to also develop better ways of learning reward functions from diverse videos or more unstructured data. In summary, we introduced few shot preference learning for human in the loop RL. We showed that by pre-training on multitask data, we can drastically reduce the number of queries needed for human in the loop RL by 20 times or more. This enables us to actually learn policies from real human feedback.